I have entitled the, the title of my little talk today, From IT to ET, but it is actually how ICT can contribute to the green economy. And when I speak about IT to ET, I'm meaning uh, from the sense of how my company and other companies in the ICT sector maybe could move closer uh, from making information technology, which is a, a set of two nouns, and going to enabling technology, which includes a verb. So there's motion and there's activity that is bringing the ICT sector and its own development and, and inventions closer to societal needs. And in that area, one imagines the enabling part of ICT, not only in uh, environmental or green, and green sector, but also in many other sectors. You can imagine healthcare, you can imagine education, you can imagine how government manages its own systems. Uh, it, there is an embedded part, which is the, uh, uh, the IT part, the, 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 the management of knowledge and the management of information that is between the equipment and the user, or the manufacturer of the, the, the source of energy and its distribution, or the, the car and the, and the system of transport. So in between, there is a, a big area which can improve tremendously the output and the use of energy, the input, in any of these sectors. So I think the idea uh, to call it that is, is quite novel, but also Friedman has actually used the word uh, 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 energy, uh, IT, as the enabler for the green economy. So there is, the thought is, is active in many areas, and we believe that the, the use of, uh, let's see. Oh yes, it does, okay. So if we, the challenge that's facing us, we know in the spirit of climate change, energy scarcity, and uh, the growing population, which is expected to reach about 10 billion, uh, in the next uh, uh, 40 years. Of course, we also have the opposite effects in some parts of the world. We have a declining population and uh, aging population. But all of these challenges will uh, uh, face, we are facing at the same time as we are coming out or hopefully coming out of one of the deepest recessions that we have had. So we are in an area where we are uh, scarce resources financially, a huge enormous problems facing us and great opportunities to find solutions for them. And I believe in that area, the idea of finding the use of ICT and using it much more efficiently can produce results. And I'll try to give you, I hope, a few ideas that optimistically seen from our, uh, from our angle, not only will help us grow our business, but we think also provide that enablement for the, uh, to reach the targets that we have set ourselves. So I will um, uh, not go into very much detail of the technical way we, we use it, but I will try to give examples of how we approach it ourselves for our own internal use and how we hope we can put it into operation for others. So as a basis, if you say Microsoft's uh, own vision of uh, environmental sustainability, we are, uh, we, as a basis of efforts in the field of environmental sustainability, a company like any other citizen should demonstrate to begin with its own environmental leadership. And we are doing this in several different ways. Uh, we change our transport fleet to begin with to hybrid vehicles. We are imposing strict rules for our own new, new buildings and changing radically even our own cafeterias. Uh, to, in order to save energy. We have measured our footprint, which we publish every year in the Carbon Disclosure Project, to be one-third from employee travel and an increasing part from the development of our data centers. And we are working on those areas to reduce the, the carbon footprint of our own. So we set a goal for ourselves uh, to reduce our direct uh, carbon footprint in relation to our revenue by 30% by 2012. And we are giving employees first-generation visualization technology and encourage them to use online technologies to reduce travel for all their meetings. And we hope to cut our travel budget costs by about 20 to 25% during that period. And at the end of the day, we're also investing in more, more modern uh, data centers, just like the one we have here in Dublin, which will reduce energy consumption. But I will go a bit more into detail about that a bit later on. If we focus our attention to the middle column to accelerate the research breakthroughs, we are beginning to see a very wide 
scope of technologies that can help reduce energy consumption at an accelerated space for the home, for business organizations, governments, which will help uh, accelerate alternative energies and cleaner energies to become a reality. ICT can also be used to help us adapt to a changing climate. Let me give you some examples. We have laboratories across the world uh, that we are advancing the art of computing and computing modeling. We understand that the focus to research is not a new tool or an application. It is a revolutionary new way of thinking in computing. In the past, research would often be looked at to solve a specific problem. Today, problems are very complex and we are applying computing modeling across a broad segment. For example, Microsoft researchers in Cambridge are currently developing a computational model to predict the evolution of forests over time which includes the impact of climate change. By modeling an area of land, which is a forest today or a wild forest, or uh, an old forest that was used for, for production of wood but is now fallen into disuse, you could plan the type of trees to be planted, the amount of fertilizers to be used, and develop a model that shows you in 50 years' time what the value of that forest is going to be as a carbon capture and as a wood producer. And the value of the forest today would, if that model is accepted as a measurement at the present state, before you actually make the investments, you can get a value for the forest which would re-put it back into the economic system and get the owner of the forest to invest in the needs of changing the trees and replanting them. So the modeling is going to be a way to allocate carbon credits. And there's a big interest in the USA where there's huge swathes in Canada and the United States of large areas of forest land which are not being used and are not being uh, applied to. And the reason is because they cannot see and prove the value of the forest if they actually did the investment. The, another example is the cloud computing. The concept of distributed computers that can interoperate and share information around the world has been known for some time. And cloud computing will offer processing powers of the likes we've never imagined. If you look at what a cloud computing really is, it means you distribute your, 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 your uh, data treatment. You don't do it in-house in PC or a, a big mainframe you have in, in, your, in your building, but you actually link through the internet to a big center like the one here, which has hundreds of thousands of servers, and you just buy the time that you actually use it. So rather than invest in hardware that is lying idle about 14 hours a day, when all your employees go, go home and is usually left on and using energy, you only buy the, the energy you need and the time you need in the data center for the few minutes or hours of a day where the computing power is enormous and where the security levels are highly enhanced. And, but however, any research project needs 10 to 20 years to come to market, given the slow uh, uptake and some legal uh, impediments that can even take another 10 years. What do we do today? to reduce the, the cycle. I would uh, uh, question if, for example, uh, we increase the or simplify the, the uh, innovation regulation, the rules around getting money for R&D, the rules about bringing a product to market, the simplicity of getting a patent. Europe is lagging behind. Researchers are leaving Europe and going elsewhere. So the speed is going to be longer for us in this part of the world if we don't approach the regulatory framework around uh, R&D centers, uh, the mobility of, 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 of researchers across Europe. I know Ireland is very interested to attract to Ireland as many researchers as can be in very particular areas. And I think green IT has been one of the areas you have allocated inside your program. And uh, also, another area is uh, making it more simple to bring the products to market. You've got to, to, to move that step. So you must enable energy efficiency to be brought to market by having a simplicity and a clear set of global rules on measuring the, uh, the allocation of, 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 of uh, credits, the use of alternative energy. How do you allow and bring in, for example, wind and solar into a grid? Here again, computer modeling that could equally model a future grid across Europe, just as it could model a forest in 10 to 15 years' time, will be needed. You will, be able, you will have to build, base your investments upon a calculation that cannot be made uh, simply uh, on today's uh, facts. You've got to generate into it the facts of the 
changing population, the changing needs, and the changing regulatory framework. So, to put it in simple words, today's energy grid is dumb. And it, it charges up power, and what is not used is then wasted. A similar problem will apply to wind energy, as I was mentioning. Your appliances in your home are sucking unneeded energy and giving nothing back. And almost 100% of the time, you have no idea how much and what expense you are consuming energy. This slide is a simple concept of what a near future would look like to resolve this. In fact, if you look at uh, the EU in its uh, 2020 strategy, Barroso, the president of the EU, outlined the need for a European smart grid. So what could that look like? It would need to resolve many challenges. The first is to figure out how alternative energy systems such as wind and photovoltaic could be able to store and transfer energy. If we find a solution, then solar farms in North Africa, wind farms from the North Sea can be intelligently distributed across Europe where and when needed. And then we would need our appliances to be smart. A fridge in your house, for example, does not need to be on all the time. It can be shut down and communicate with the energy grid as to when it is the best time to consume the minimum power it needs to keep the food safe. We can apply the same concepts to dishwashers and washing machines to turn on and off to consume cheap power. In the near future, such technology is critical. I think software will help make the grid and advanced energy systems work. They will be intelligent enough to talk to a smart grid to buy and bid and sell to the grid. This is a small part of what Jeremy Rifkin calls the third industrial revolution. The development of such technologies will generate in tremendous prosperity, jobs and economic growth. It is the first time that we are seeing NGOs and industry and governments coming together to help our environment that also helps build the economy. But there are obstacles we need to solve immediately. When you see up on the screen today is impossible in many European countries, not because of the technology of which in many cases we have, but because as a consumer, you would need to manually put in the energy consumption information into a measurement tool. A lot of this information is sitting with the utilities, but there are strict privacy laws that make it difficult for the consumer to see the consumption use. These obstacles can be resolved by a few swift strokes of a pen. And when consumers can see the energy a halogen lamp, for example, is causing, or what it means in euro savings not to use clothes dryers, uh, they will begin to believe in the system and begin to see the impact. If you add to this even uh, economic uh, carrots, uh, the tax system, the, the benefits one could apply, we will see the adoption of what I would call data in the hands of the user, so that the citizen becomes the scientist. But he has not got access to that yet. Uh, you have to be very much interested personally to, to be involved in managing even your own home. But if you see where the future of technology is going, we actually have a vision at Microsoft called Three Screens on the Cloud, which is uh, your mobile phone, your computer screen, or any, and, and, a and your television usually, which is the large screen you have at home, but you could imagine any surface in your fridge, in your kitchen unit, in, in your, in your uh, uh, bedroom or television room, which could be the third screen, and linking that to the distributed idea of data in a, in a data center far away where you don't have the heavy investment of the software system or the server to manage it, you can see this being uh, potentially available even to the single home. But I would see it starting with new construction in factories and industries to begin with. I could imagine it being taken up in government departments, in big areas where big large chunks of data are stored, in hospitals and in healthcare, because that's where the urgent economic pressure is. On the building uh, existing homes, the re-installation re, re, uh, into into existing homes, I think that will be one of the last, uh, the latest, the, the, the further down the road. New construction in, in, in homes is potentially doable. I was spent about 20 years in my beginning of my career in the construction industry, and changing the norms in the construction industry is a very difficult task. We know that. But I think we should be passing a message to the authorities to begin to work along that. If you 
Now think about what this uh, is a, a very com uh, busy slide, but it shows uh, an existing control panel for a company. You could see if you had to install that in your own company, it would, uh, you could be able to, you wouldn't understand what is behind it as a user, but the information you get to compete with your neighboring building, you can see your own building's uh, use of energy at any time of the day, and it will change, and the, it will be a constant moving of dials that are telling you where your energy is being used, how much of it, and you will be able, if you install a grid like this uh, on your screen when you come home, it will tell you to uh, the tip, uh, the water heater, it speaks about what the neighbor is doing and how much is going into, into the cooling systems next door. Now, this company does not exist because this company is a fictional company we have created, set it up uh, an, an, an imaginary situation where you could put your own control screen. So Contoso is a fictional company, but the software is in operation, does exist, and can be applied to other existing companies around the world. Change can happen. I think this is quite important, that once you do put the system in place, you will beginning to see the results. So we don't have the answer today that there is a huge learning curve for all of us. The one thing is certain, that ICT can generate growth. People and companies and governments have started to build a momentum that will continue to make these changes. We are gearing up fast to meet the challenges ahead. Today, investments are crucial in finding solutions. And uh, investments in R&D will only happen if we do have a strong intelligence base. Let's take uh, a group we are putting together. We are working on a project that will bring together five European universities that are analyzing what is the, uh, the um, operational impact of ICT in energy saving. And we are looking at three and four sectors, like the transport sector, like uh, harbors and ports, and, and, and uh, um, the industry, uh, particular sector of industry, like, like, for example, the cement manufacturing. And the idea being to measure together with uh, a group of companies then and the NGOs involved in the sector. So we would take the Train Driving Association, the, the, the Association for Car Manufacturers, and put them together to, with the universities and examine what could be done if we, to save energy in the transport sector, for example, if we improve the allocation of ships coming into a harbor and trucks coming into the harbor from the land. So if you have to manage that as a, 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 an airport so that the trucks coming with containers don't go straight into the harbor and rush in to be first in to offload the, the, the containers and leave, and leave a pile of containers that are waiting for ships coming into harbor and then have to resort them out in stacks. But you would put docking places 100 kilometers away from the cities and manage this in a computer system that will send the trucks in straight onto the ship which would have come into harbor to pick up the container. And in that way, you would manage to reduce the, the uh, traffic congestion of the city, the waiting times for the transporters, and the waiting times and the marriage of the ships. And the savings there could be 15 to 20 percent just by m improving the traffic. The same would apply to landing and taking off at airports. One could improve even the, the uh, environmental impact of an airport by about 15 percent by managing the takeoff and the landing in, in a more, uh, even more organized way than we do today. So you can pick up the airplanes more than two, three, four hundred kilometers away from the landing rather than wait to pick them up in the last 60 kilometers and to plan the landing. So you avoid all the waiting time on top of airports and you can improve that as well. So we are trying to measure today how one can do that. What we meet will be, of course, obstacles in the way of trade unions, in the way of uh, government regulations, in the way of international rules on transport across borders. And that is where we think we will have to work together and then go out and make a, a plea to governments to do the changes necessary to put those uh, systems into operation. If we move now into one other question I've got, uh, which is how can we uh, use the, um, 
uh, ICT to, to uh, promote growth. And I take, for example, one area, which is uh, the, the data centers. The title of the slide is taken from an article that appeared in the New York Times recently. And uh, the, the question, even though it's, uh, the weather is, is cold today, is probably uh, ideal to answer it. Because the one thing that data centers like is the weather in Ireland. Uh, because if you take a data center as a, typically a center which has very many servers in one location and uses a lot of energy, and many of these centers are based on cooling systems that also need to be put into operation, and they also are based on water. So you're using water for cooling, and that is very demanding in, in energy and in, in water, which is a scarce resource in many places. In Dublin, we find that Whereas in most places you need 95% of the time to have your cooling system in operation, in Ireland it's only about 30% of the time. And sometimes uh, it can even go down to about 15% of the time when you have a bit of a bad weather spell, which you tend to have here sometimes. But that is uh, the, the concept of having uh, the benefit of, of your, what sometimes can be seen as a negative, turning into a positive and attracting here the, the, the development of this new technology. Because there is one area where transferring data away from a location inside your building, inside your company, inside your government ministry, where you believe you have more control over it than otherwise, and transferring it for treatment to a data center will meet, apart from the environmental effects, as we were mentioning there, where in Ireland they are lower than anywhere else, will meet with certain restrictions that come out from the conflict of laws. Because as data is, if I'm an Italian company and I'm transferring my data to Ireland into a data center run by an American company and I'm using it in my Latvian subsidiary, the question arises which law applies. If the Italian law says that data has to be retained in a data center for six months and not longer, and the law in Ireland says you must retain data for at least one year, and the American government says, this is an American company, I would like to have access to that data. You have different laws applying on the same data, and therefore people are reticent to move along. Now, if you imagine that Ireland proposes or finds a solution that creates something like a data-free zone, or an area where data is given special treatment during the time it's being, it's being treated in a data center, and to be governed by the law of the owner of the data during all times, we could imagine that being a spur to the development of this technology, and Ireland being the center that will attract many more of these investments. On the other hand, you also get the benefit that when you do set up uh, data centers in, in, your, in your region, you can, as a government, give startup companies a benefit of having access to that data uh, treatment without having to invest in hardware because that is the benefit of going towards cloud computing. But if the government were to put into its system of attracting startups to come to Ireland a year, two years of free data treatment in the center which the government would provide because you pay for data treatment by the hour, by the day, this would attract even more startups to come to Ireland. I remember a year ago we launched a BizSpark in Ireland with the, uh, which has a quite a big success where the government subsidizes the start of an industry and, and companies like ours were giving free software for the startup companies. And that attracted companies to start up. But they still had to invest in quite a lot of capital expenditure to set up their data treatment, their PCs, and their servers. If you can even eliminate that cost for a startup company, you will attract even more. There is a study by Professor Etro at the university in Milan, which actually says that about, uh, I think the example was for a small country that would give this uh, beneficial subsidy to a startup company, it was about 20,000 SMEs in the first three years would start up, which would otherwise not have started up. And some of them, a good percentage of them, would come from abroad. Excuse me. It's not just Irish entrepreneurs who would start up, but others would come in to join. Uh, and for Europe, this would be about, the vision is if, 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 if cloud computing is adopted uh, in a sort of relatively rapid way, say over seven, eight years, you would get uh, about 0.3% of GDP improvement across Europe just by that, uh, not counting the energy savings. This was just uh, in, in startup, uh, new companies, and new business. 
I want to end up with a, a, an example of uh, an environmental uh, program, and you will see, I think, some live screens outside. I've taken some uh, uh, shots of this uh, lot based on Wednesday's uh, data. This is called Eye on Earth. The interesting about this project, it is an environmental project started by the European Environment Agency in Copenhagen, and we launched it in Copenhagen at the COP15. And it is based on cloud computing. So this is actually, uh, uh, the data here is being treated not in the service in Copenhagen belonging to the agency, but actually here in Dublin. And the data is collected by sensors from about 60,000 uh, collection spots across Europe. The blue are uh, uh, water sites, which is the first uh, iteration of this. This is a two-year-old project. But now, this year, we launched the orange and the yellow sites, which are the air quality. And these are being collected by sensors on the spot in city centers, in, 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 cent in places where the air quality tends to be difficult. And uh, it is collected and transmitted automatically without human intervention, without the intervention of an authority measuring the air and sending a report, which was the way water and beaches and clean water areas across Europe, the tourist industry knows where I come from in Malta and the South, we're very dependent on that. We used to send in our reports, the water's always clean, of course. Uh, the beaches are, are perfect. But this system allows, apart from the fact that you are collecting live data, and you'll see what Dublin was, uh, for example, the air quality in Dublin just on Wednesday, and you're measuring uh, ozone, you're measuring particles, and you're measuring NOx. So you can see uh, the, 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 the lower you are, you are below the, the three measurements, green, orange, and red, uh, you are better. So the, the higher it goes, the closer you come to the limits of, uh, of emissions and where people should not go out or it can, you can have to take some action. But the interesting thing about this is that it's data-driven decision-making. So you're moving away, it's a new world we're going to, and, but the citizen himself can also respond to this. I think this is the other chart will show it. Uh, where the citizen, this is now the, um, the quality of where we are right now. I think this is taken uh, North Great George Street, uh, which is somewhere around the corner, I believe. So, and outside you can go and look where your summer house is or where your children are studying. But you could see air and the water quality. But apart from the fact that this is a cloud computing system, uh, the data is being treated here in Dublin that is being measured and uh, utilized by the European agency, any user can, by picking his telephone uh, or his computer, press the button on the screen, which allows you, and go back, I think you can see that we go back, which allows you to respond to it, and you can give the, the rating by the users. You telephone this number, and it tells you, put your location in, and it gives you the answer. Do you think, do you agree with the findings? So as people were responding in Greece to the previous first round of this program, which was based on reporting rather than sensing, people were responding, and about 50,000 responses to the Greek beaches was that they were not good. And the message was saying they are excellent. And things were happening. You know, people were beginning to be criticized. But now it's getting much better, because even the beaches are being collected through automatic sensing. And uh, people are offering their own telephones to be collectors. So you can be a collector as you walk around. It's collecting the data. <coughs> and you can immediately also decide to be a responder. But you can do it even if you don't sign up to it. You can always respond, go in and say, I don't agree with what you're saying about Dublin. And the, and the interesting thing is that it respond, the system is responding to the data given by anybody who applies to it. So as the numbers increase of the responses, the sensor is asked to re-measure. Re and, and, and So what is interesting about this, I think, is that it is going to lead us to a new world, I hope, and I believe firmly, where there'll be much more of this data-driven decision-making. It will happen in the healthcare area where patients are going to be measuring themselves in a very regular fashion. We have a, 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 an example, I would have loved to bring it along with me, where we have sort of the house of the future. I'm one of the aging population that uh, Europe is going to suffer from in the next for three or four years. We're all, a lot of us are going to retire. 30% of the population in Sweden is going to retire. Deutsche Bahn, which has a million employees, is losing 350,000 of them between next year and the following year as a company. That is the train system in Germany. 
So what, what do you do in these situations? I mean, how do you deal with these uh, people? Do they all go into homes and hospitals? We can't take it. The cost is too high. So the idea being that you can stay at home, your blood pressure, your, your urine, your, all your measurements are taken and immediately stored in a center where your doctor and only the people whom you're allowed to take access with, your children, your family, have access to it. There's a photo, a camera where you've got to go by at a certain time every day, speak to your doctor, he sees the color of your skin, see how you're feeling, your blood pressure is taken, and he knows that you're okay. And he can even prescribe medicine that is delivered to you at home. So the idea being that as we move forward, there are many solutions that can be applied for everyday use. And just as the idea of knowing that your light bulb or your uh, washing machine is spending so much of your revenue, or knowing that you need some, some help and, and, and some treatment, but you have help is, is, is close by, will allow, I think, new solutions that we haven't yet put into operation. But they are just down the road. They are being tested in, in test, test cases. And we believe that at least we are convinced that this is going to be a very big uh, b business opportunity for many, many companies, not just us who develop the, up to now, IT, the static plumbing for systems, because we are an IT company, we do software, but those who make the applications. And the people who prepare applications like this, home of the future, where, where you have the blood pressure measured and transmitted over the net, to your doctor where your data is being stored in the center. They're not prepared by Microsoft, so by the big uh, Oracle. They are prepared by the small application company, a small Belgian, a small Irish. There are about 180,000 such companies across Europe that are based, basing themselves on uh, uh, improvements to the software that we make in our research centers to apply them to these small ideas, like and I'll give you another example. There are, in hospitals, small pieces of equipment, you know, fibrillators and small mobile x-ray machines. They usually are about 15 in a hospital or 20, and they, need, they would need many more, but they don't have that many, so they move them from one department to the other. The head nurses in most departments hide them so that they know that when their department needs it, they have it. And the system has been developed by a small Belgian company that marks... And, and, and have a system of, 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 of uh, monitoring and geographically finding through GSM all of these machines in the hospital at any time. For maintenance is the reason that the hospital manager puts it in. The obvious reason is to get them to be used efficiently all the day and not being used one, five minutes for one day when they are needed 24 hours a day. And a similar system like this, data-driven decision-making, not people-driven decision-making, can lead to much more environmental saving. It's also a good business proposition. It leads to more software, more, more data for our, and I'm not ashamed to say that. I think we, we can be involved in finding the solutions. But most importantly, it is the small companies that actually are inventing and putting the solutions into operation. These 180,000 companies that are working on on the Microsoft technology, like them there are another hundreds of thousands working on our competing technologies, they employ over a million people in Europe. So it's quite interesting to see how the local developments, national uh, benefits coming out of it uh, are, are very good for the economy. But we need to overcome that fear of taking the steps towards uh, applying technology in our daily lives. Thank you very much indeed.